Welcome to the Great Traits Project podcast. We investigate the character traits that drive great achievements and reveal the mindset behind success. Throughout these podcasts, we introduce you to remarkable individuals from the world of sports, business, the military, the arts, science, technology, groundbreaking explorers, and many more. We shed light on how they behave and what they believe, and we discuss their attitude to life. In November 2016, we released our first book, which is called Great Traits. The book reveals the five character traits that make successful people tick, and it can be found on Amazon by searching for Great Traits, or search for the author's name, Tobias Harwood, which is spelled T-O-B-I-A-S, and then Harwood, H-A-R-W-O-O-D. All the author's proceeds from the sale of the book are donated to the charity Walking with the Wounded. The reason why the proceeds are donated to the charity are explained in the opening chapter of the book. On this month's podcast, we have something a little different. We have a scientist who specialises in the psychology of extreme and isolated environments. The man in question is Dr Nathan Smith. He has a degree in sport and exercise science and has a PhD in sport and exercise psychology. He's also a lecturer in sports psychology at the University of Northampton. He focuses on the psychology of extreme and isolated environments, such as astronaut training, explorers, deep-sea divers and high-altitude mountaineers. He also looks at motivation in sports and the role of physical activity in the promotion of psychological health. For this podcast, we talk about the psychological attributes that you need to survive and thrive in extreme environments. We also look at how to manage anxiety, how to build resilience. We discuss the role of self-belief, strategies to cope with pain, goal setting and gratitude. And with that, I introduce you to Dr. Nathan Smith. Okay, so I'm Dr. Nathan Smith. I'm a lecturer in sports psychology at the University of Northampton. My research interests are in psychology and extreme environments, um, trying to understand who copes well in difficult situations, how we can support them, what's their operating in challenging environments, and then what happens when they come back. Okay, brilliant. So um, for, for people that are unfamiliar with this, Nathan, can you just sort of give us an idea of like, uh, what, what are the extreme environments that you're talking about? Okay, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, being a, an academic, I love a definition, so that's probably what I'll kick off with. Um, so when we talk about extreme environments, we actually, we're talking about situations that have extreme physical, psychological and interpersonal demands. So there might be difficult weather conditions, difficult living environments. There's also kind of stress, danger, anxiety associated with operating in those situations. And then there tends to be, if, you, if you're in a group, of two or more people, there tends to be some interesting interpersonal dynamics going on. And if those dynamics go wrong, then you tend to have a bit of a problem. So from the research you have conducted yourself and from other research in the field, let's kick off with what are the kind of psychological attributes that you think you need to survive in these extreme environments? Yeah, so there are i guess we can split it down a little bit into into short duration and longer duration stays in difficult circumstances um and here we're talking about extreme environments that could include antarctic research stations astronauts and cosmonauts going onto the space station as well as polar crossings mountaineering um those sort of environments there obviously are some distinctions between those but you know we group them under these extreme environment banners for short duration tri- trips mostly you know, we're looking for people that are competent at what they're doing, that, that tend to be emotionally stable. So they're not they're not easily anxious. They don't have like big ups and downs necessarily. Um, and that can get on well with people under those kind of trying circumstances. And that's kind of what, what characterizes the short duration missions or, or trips. You know, most people can do them as long as they have a kind of general capability in those circumstances. For the longer duration kind of missions or stays in Antarctica, space station you know, potentially a mars mission it gets a little bit more complicated and it, it probably gets a bit more contextualized so for instance uh, what the academics are talking about at the moment and the scientists in terms of a mars mission is you know do we want someone that is socially compatible but also is really happy spending time on their own um, so they don't have to be interacting with people all the time they can go and sit in a corner for three months reading a book and be quite happy you know that they can withstand boredom and monotony those those sort of things which 
if you've spent time in extreme environments, you know that there, there tends to be long periods of kind of the monotonous, the boredom. So people that can withstand those situations. I guess if we're thinking, you know, I'm a scientist, so I, I obviously like to go into the science of it. Um, from a kind of personality point of view, we tend to talk about people who are quite agreeable, people who are conscientious, so they plan and prepare well. Um, but also they're flexible when things kind of change, which that can happen quite quickly in, in extreme settings. And how do you measure those types of things? So we tend to, I mean, the, the first way we would measure them from a psychological point of view is to screen people. So using psychometric measures, um, there are some kind of popular measures out there that measure big five personality characteristics and all that sort of stuff. Um usually accompanied by a, an interview as well. So you'd sit down with a, a psychologist and they'd probably try and dig a little bit into your background and, and figure out what you've what you've done and how you cope with those things in the past um, to build a bit of a picture of who these people are um, and what they might be capable of doing. Are there any resources out there that uh, people can look at to do a kind of quick and dirty test themselves? Yeah, so there, there are some freely available things. So... Um, there's a, a scale called the Big Five Inventory, and we've used that in several projects recently with mountaineers, with armed forces personnel, and different kind of extreme groups. And it's freely available. You can download it in a bit of bit of googling, and you, you're not too far away from from getting that measure. Um, and then it has all the instructions with it, so you can create your own brief profile and have a look to see how you compare to other people. Um, so that's one from a personality point of view. There's also things like personal values, which are indicators of motivation. So you can see what, what you value in life and, and what you what kind of drives you to make decisions to do certain things. So let's talk about motivation then, if we're talking about values. What's, what are the common sources or drivers uh, motivating people to go into extreme environments? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Toby. So we, we've recently just published some work on that and we... We actually looked at a variety of groups. So we looked at some special forces personnel, people who overwintered in Concordia. We looked at people taking part in Mars simulation studies. So they're, they're kind of confined for f over 500 days. And we looked at mountaineers and we saw a, a pretty similar pattern. So they all rated self-direction as being really important to them. So they like to be creative. They like to make decisions. They like to, you know, kind of take that that step and, and be in charge of their own kind of destiny, if you like. Um, all of the groups rated what we call benevolence as being really important. So they try to maintain the group functioning. They try and make sure that things are working for the group and maintain that kind of sense of belonging in the group. We saw a little bit of a discrepancy in, in terms of maybe some of the more mobile groups. So the mountaineers and the special forces personnel tended to report higher scores on things like hedonism, wanting to get that kind of sense of enjoyment and maybe a bit of the thrill as well. Um, whereas the other groups that were isolated and confined tended to um, score that a bit lower and were more interested in kind of universalism, so contributing something to society and giving back, thinking about things beyond your kind of own sphere outside of your world, maybe. Shall we just touch on, you talk there about conducting research with people who spend 500 days alone. Was it alone or, or in... So there were six people confined in a habitat which basically emulated a what they would envisage a Mars capsule to look like. Um, so it had the kind of living quarters, the workstations, and they and they kind of simulated the whole the whole mission. So they had they went out for I think it was about nine months. They did like a mock landing on Mars, and then they kind of came back and they had the kind of time delay. So you know they're having to wait for twenty minutes, twenty five minutes to talk with the outside mission control. Um, so it was, a, it was a full simulation of what... And where were what, they based for the simulation? So the simulation was done in Russia, um, but it was there were some Russian participants, Italian, Chinese and French, I believe. What sort of skills do you think are sort of required by these individuals? Not Not necessarily just for a sort of mock Mars mission, but in all sorts of different extreme environments. If you looked at it from a competency framework point of view, there's probably loads of things that you'd be looking for. I mean, you know, in those small groups, you probably want people that are comfortable taking control of a situation. Um, again, you know, that not being easily anxious and fearful, I think is going to be important for people performing well. So they're quite, 
they're not easily swayed. So when things are going really well, they're not going really high. And when things are going really badly, they're not going really low. So they've got that kind of stability. Clearly, you want them to be competent. So they've developed the skills before they get into that environment, um, particularly if it's something that's maybe a bit more self-supporting, a little bit more extreme compared to maybe, say, some of the youth expeditions that they use those as a way of developing those skills. If it's something that's a little bit more on the edge of what people are capable of, you're probably going to want people that are, are kind of equipped with the skills before they go. And then being able to kind of rely on your own kind of ingenuity. Um, so being able to come up with solutions to problems as they happen. You know, we can prepare people as well as possible, but almost everyone I speak to that goes on expeditions or spends time in an extreme environment say that something happens that they've not necessarily prepared for or considered, um, even though they've planned really thoroughly. So being able to solve solve problems as they occur, I think, is an important one. So it's a tricky balance between you want to automate a huge proportion of your behaviour for kind of simplicity, efficiency and so on, but then you need to be massively kind of creative with whatever you're facing at that particular time. Yeah, absolutely. I think that goes back to some of the personality stuff I, I mentioned at the start is this idea of we plan thoroughly and we prepare as well as possible, but then we're flexible when things don't quite go right. So we can change if we need to. And then if you think about the values I spoke about, you know, self-direction yeah. is clearly important there for these people that can take the ball by the horns and actually uh, make good decisions under stress. If we just try and relate this to people in everyday life, um, are there any kind of particular uh, tips or suggestions you can make for somebody? I don't know if someone's taking on an Ironman or a marathon or whatever. Is there anything you can take from your research to say to them, actually, this is a helpful suggestion? Yeah, I actually had a few days ago with starting a project with someone that's about to row, row the Atlantic in um, 2017. Um, and he was asking the very same question, what, what can I do? And there, there are loads of things we can do. You know, things like thinking about when things get tough, how are you going to break the goals down so you, you get those little wins as you go? Um, so you're not necessarily thinking about finishing, but you're focusing on the here and now. Um, but with that, we also know that during kind of expeditions, we get a bit of a time shift. So, you know, beyond the halfway point is when we might start looking at the end up to that point, we might be focusing more on what's happening at this very moment in time. So we've seen a little bit of that coming through in some research that we've been doing recently. Um, and then things like, you know, trying to keep a positive view, using sense of humour. Um, so seeing the situation in a, in a positive way, you know, it's amazing how much we can determine our mindset just by thinking positively. You know, that's within our control. We can, we can make an active decision to actually try and find good stuff um in the bad there's so many elements there that we can go into and talk about and i'd love to talk about them all but just before we scoot away from the idea of goals um one thing i wanted to mention which was really interesting was when i interviewed george bullard who holds the world record for the longest ever uh, polar expedition uh, he survived for 114 days um, and then also when i interviewed pen haddo who was the first man to trek solo um, unsupported from the uh, coastal line of Canada to the North Pole, they both said that they would never think about the end goal. It was so short term in that literally on day one, it would be survive, literally cover some ground, put the tent up, get some sleep, get up the next day. Yeah. And it's amazing to think how short termist they were thinking. Um, and I suppose that prevents you becoming overwhelmed is that right yeah yeah i mean absolutely so you know that that refocuses the attention you know when when our brain is starting to wander or we're starting to feel a bit stressed or a bit tired or fatigued um and we're thinking about maybe giving up then we use this sort of goal setting strategy to redirect, redirect our attention to kind of getting those little wins and you know breaking it down small can be very small um we did a project with um, the polar kind of explorer Ben Saunders, okay, who, yes. who yeah. spoke in a paper that we published not that long ago about the idea of when it was really tough at the beginning and he was pulling all of his weight, is the idea of he was literally moving a word on one ski past the word on another ski, you know. So you're talking centimeters, um, that and that amazing, was that was his aim, it? you know, just to to kind of keep those skis moving past each other. 
for you know hours and hours and hours um and then you know when i was talking about the, the change in time um phase we've recently seen some guys that were trekking across the empty quarter desert in um, the middle east talk about the change in kind of what they were looking for at different phases of the expedition so early on they were thinking about the here and now you know okay. the next okay. goal getting through that next mile the next hour um, and then as it got close to the end that was when they started to think more about the finish so as it got kind of that time got nearer that was when they could start maybe you can look like dare yourself about to think yeah George Bullard said something really interesting to me which was to help their recognition of progress they got a, a thick marker pen and they drew a line on, on the side of their tent and they would kind of tick off points so they could recognise along this kind of line, which was equivalent to a scale, you know, they would tick off when they were roughly at the halfway point. And he said that totally changed their mindset. You know, it's a fantastic way of kind of, one, giving yourself that little confidence boost, you know, I'm, I'm making progress, but also, you know, that's in your control. You know, you can get from point A to point B. That's something that you can decide on. Um, and there might be lots of other stuff that's outside of your control, you know, the weather and yes. conditions and all that sort of stuff. But those those things are within our own sense of um, responsibility and we can actually do that, which is good for our kind of psychological health, I guess. This, this is a question I was going to ask later, but we've kind of organically wandered into it. So I'd love to talk to you about the idea of mindset and is the mindset you adopt a choice? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd say I'd say it is. I think there's there's like lots of competing factors going on there, and it's clearly going to be shaped by the environment you're in. So some some of the other work I do that's I guess less related to extreme environments and a more social psychological perspective, you know, that that environment that's created by people around us will shape our mindset. But it's definitely from an individual point of view, you know, you are in control of that. You know, you can shape how you think by using certain strategies, self-talk, maybe um, cognitive restructuring, kind of rational thinking, that sort of stuff. So we can we can manipulate that. Um, Let's just clarify, what, what is cognitive restructuring? You know, so if, if you're kind of in a spiral of negative thought patterns, it's this, this idea of acknowledging it, identifying what you're kind of saying to yourself. You know, we have, we have lots of thoughts every day. We're constantly talking to ourselves. A lot of it's not very nice um, often. And it's it's trying to identify that and then go, you know, is that helping me? If it's not, what can I replace it with? Um, it's a bit like this mindfulness kind of stuff that's popular at the moment. But, you know, this, this has been around a long time. You kind of, the idea of harnessing what we are saying to ourselves to make us either more productive or perform better, um, you know, we can, we can do that and that's within our control. So... Um how do, how do you think or can you sh share with people any thoughts on how can you build psychological resilience? I think we can do, you know, we can do lots of stuff to prepare us for that. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's stuff we can do in a classroom where we sat down and we're, we're doing it. But you know, I'm hesitant to say that that's the only way. And I think actually some of the research findings that we've been getting recently from the extreme group shows that often you have to go and put yourself in some stressful situations to actually build that resilience. You know, if we wrap people up in cotton wool and they never experience any kind of stress, then that that isn't going to help them build a resilient um, mentality or even kind of personality. So a bit of adversity is good. And we, we see that in, you know, elite athletes. They talk about adversity experiences helping them achieve. You know, they've got to fail a lot to win. Um, we see it in, you know, people going into the polar regions and mountains that talk about, you know, those real demanding circumstances actually teach me a lot about what I'm capable of and maybe you know what Ben Saunders said to us was that you know completing the Scott expedition really shifted his reference points you know yes. of what he was yes. actually capable of yeah. um, which is a nice way to view it it's interesting you talk about the sports people as well because um, for for the book great traits i interviewed chrissy wellington so she was four times ironman world champion uh, she was never beaten in an ironman race and she's the ironman world record holder and she said to me the way you deal with pain and discomfort and suffering is to experience pain and discomfort and suffering yeah. and that was it and i thought it was a really powerful message yeah because you know that happens you experience it and you know, at the time you think wow this is this is horrible but then it ends Yes. And, and you're through it and, you know, and you're okay. And so it's a, it's a kind of, 
a view builder, if you like, of what, what you can experience and actually come out the other side. One question I'm always asked on the back of the book is, and it's probably the most popular question, is these five traits that you reveal in the book, are they innate or are they learnt? So if we talk about the ideas that you've talked about and the the, uh, concepts of self-direction and benevolence and hedonism and so on, and maybe these traits around psychological resilience that you've talked about, what's your view on are they innate or uh, are they learnt? I think we'll all start at different places. So to to some extent, they're innate. You know, some people, by nature of how they grew up and the people that surrounded them, their personalities will be different to other people. A lot of the personality literature says that personality gets set in and, you know, it's stable and all that sort of stuff. But there's also quite a lot of work out there to suggest that these things can change, especially with big formative experiences and with a bit of effort. You know, one thing I like about personal values is that actually our values can shift. And we've shown that in several studies that values can move over time um, and they can be reordered. You know, what what we value in one context might be different to what we value in another. Um, and I like that because it means that our motivations can can shape, you know, how our behaviour and how we think and how we feel. And um, So, yeah, I definitely think we we'll probably start at different points, but we can definitely change for the better. And let's talk about, um, obviously you touched on there about motivations. Let's talk about rewards for a minute. Why, why do you think people put themselves in these extreme scenarios? Do you know, there's been, there's been some quite interesting work on this. So there, there's some guys over in um, Bangor University in Wales. They're nestled at kind of the foot of Snowdonia National Park. So they're clearly they're into all this stuff. Um, and for a few years now, they've been looking at why people engage in high risk sports or high risk activities. Um, and they're kind of the initial work on that went back a few years to this idea of sensation seeking you know people they go and do it for the thrill and that's the common i guess misconception as some people like you know i'm sure they do do it for the thrill but we can't bracket everyone in going into these high risk environments as thrill seekers so one one of the kind of lines of thought that came out of that was this idea of emotion regulation and um, the idea that some people they can't experience a big change in their emotions so they struggle to recognize a change in their emotions until they're put under real extremes of stress and it's only then when they actually can feel their emotions changing and notice it so it gives them a context in which to regulate that and so they get that kind of emotional shift and then they can regulate it so that's one pattern of thought the other is it's to do with agency um you know this Often, especially in the Western world, we have to go to work and we have jobs where we're told what to do and we don't particularly feel in control. And often these contexts allow us to make lots of decisions, really shape our experience um, and really truly feel like we're doing something um, that's purposeful and important to us. Um, so that's that's the other kind of line of thought. And I guess those two together, that, that kind of explains quite a lot of why we might do something like that. It's essentially rewards that are not available to people in everyday life, right? Yeah, and beyond beyond just material things as well. Um, I'm sure some people do go on these expeditions or try and do these big adventures to get famous or get sponsorship or whatever it is. But I think a lot of the time people are doing it because it gives them a, a sense of satisfaction or you know a, a, some kind of reward that's not necessarily accessible in, in everyday life. One of the things which your research touches on is the idea of post-traumatic growth, right? Um, can, can you just clarify what is that? Talk us through the concept and what have you found? A few years ago, some researchers started applying what we call post-traumatic growth theory to study expeditions um, and extreme environment personnel. Post-traumatic growth theory, the, the theory itself comes from the trauma literature. So the idea that when people experience trauma, um, they can come out of the other side of it identifying things that they've learned about themselves and maybe some even some positive responses to it and we're talking here about you know, some of the work's been done with holocaust survivors and people that have undergone really serious kind of traumatic experiences and actually you know, they they get on with their lives and they tend to live meaningful and, and happy lives even though they've had to deal with something really major um by definition extreme environments aren't necessarily traumatic but they are really stressful um and, you know, there's lots of stresses that cluster together in those situations. There can be um, instances of trauma. You know, if you're climbing, you know, high altitude mountaineering in the Himalayas, 
Um, it's not that uncommon to see bodies left on the mountain and you know, you, there's not many contexts in life where you see that. Um, so there they can be traumatic experiences with those things. Um, so we, we kind of applied this framework to look at whether people who undergo, the first study was on high altitude mountaineers, undergo um, stressful mountaineering expeditions, reported growth following their expeditions. Um, we actually saw that it was over 80% of people said that they grew as a result of doing their expedition or the most recent expedition. And that was kind of categorized across five themes. So personal strength, feeling like if you can do this, you can do anything. Um, being able to relate better to other people. So you know, learning something about group and team functioning, interacting with other people under stressful circumstances teaches you about how to do that in everyday life. Appreciating the value of life. So really knowing what it means to be alive. Maybe having more possibilities for the future because you acquire a certain skill set doing these things that maybe allows you to do and achieve other things in other parts of your life. Um, and then spiritual awareness, which tends to be rated kind of lower than the other aspects of growth. But we certainly do see some people talking about maybe having a more broad awareness of spiritual matters and you know the kind of insights into being a, a meaningful person and, and kind of understanding that a bit better. Should we talk about any of those particular categories in um, a bit more detail? And should we talk about kind of self-belief? Is self-belief the kind of all-encompassing bubble in which all these different elements sit? Yeah, I think I think potentially that's one explanation. You know, the personal strength aspect definitely resonates with a lot of people. You know, when you talk to them about doing these things, there's not many people you talk to that don't say, you know, if I, if I can overcome that, I can overcome whatever I get thrown at me. Um and that tends to be split down between a kind of confidence with upcoming tasks. So, you know, feeling like I can do the next thing on my list, but also a resilience, which is the kind of ability to bounce back from stressful scenarios or circumstances. So we get this kind of double pronged growth, if you like, of the confidence to overcome stuff in the future, but also the resilience to bounce back from things that are, are difficult, which is quite nice. You know, we've got both sides of that. So the point on gratitude I think is really interesting because it's essentially saying to fully appreciate your life or, or perhaps to appreciate your life as best as you can you need to deliberately seek out discomfort and hardship and well, not necessarily extremes but I feel like that's maybe a kind of that's a, a value which maybe other people out there in, the, in kind of you know the rest of society can kind of think about and maybe um, consider in their sort of everyday lives. Yeah, and I think you know we see this appreciation for life, and we are, we see in we've done several interview projects now where people doing expeditions in terms of the people we focused on talk about having a better balance and really understanding what's important to me and what you know what I shouldn't really get stressed about and some, what's trivial and what's actually what's valuable. I don't think you necessarily have to go and climb a mountain to figure that out. But I do think getting out of your kind of comfort zone helps with really identifying those important parts of your life um, and what, what is and isn't meaningful. Can you give us a sort of more specific list of what people prioritised and how that changed? Well, I think the relating to others thing, you know, we, we've had several people talk to us about coming back and going, you know, my relationship with my my partner or my children wasn't as good as it should have been or could have been. Um, and I came back from, you know, six weeks or th three months away, uh, having spent you know, all that time stuck in a tent with someone else and, you know, dealing with lots of issues. And I feel better equipped now to actually have good conversations with my partner or my kids or whoever it is that's important to me. So, you know, there's things like that kind of relationship stuff, you know, thinking about maybe some kind of materialistic things, you know, not, not needing all that stuff you know if i turn my phone off for three months you know, the world doesn't end so you know so that so that idea of finding a bit of time for myself where whatsapp and instagram isn't constantly pinging at me um, i think people value that some people value it not everyone we've talked about the benefits the motivation and i think they're probably i suppose the softer side let's talk shall we about pain, sleep deprivation, boredom, loneliness, all of these concepts crop up. So what what can we learn about 
pain and tolerating pain from from the research so often when we talk when we try and understand people in these settings you know there are there are a long list of stressors that people go through and you know pain and suffering is one of them um you know it may endure chronically for the whole time you're away it may not but you're probably going to experience it at some point um and we see that if you can find bursts of positive emotion you know finding those positive feelings at some point that can help ameliorate those kind of feelings of pain and suffering so just l- little bits of positive input uh, from an emotional point of view can help manage some of that stuff and you know if you dig into the kind of extreme exceptional and torturous environment work that um, john leach published some stuff recently on this um, if we can find ways to give people those little bursts throughout these difficult stressful um, ongoing kind of episodes then that helps manage some of those those difficult situations um so emo- to me emotions are kind of really interesting in this context yeah. because that yeah. i think often shapes the experience people have yeah. um, and has, has a big impact on pe- how people are thinking and ultimately then determines how teams work together and you know whether people start getting a bit irritated at each other and that sort of stuff talking about the recollection of emotions post the event right is it right as far as i understand the recollection that we have of pain is based on the peak of pain and the pain at the end of the experience is is that right yeah there's there's some there's some stuff i'm not i won't claim to be an expert necessarily on pain research um what i guess what i can talk about a little bit is in terms of uh, stresses which pain comes into that We'll see. We'll see kind of changes in that throughout trips, and there's kind of typical patterns of what people will experience. The a bit of a dip towards the the third phase when they're away, which then recovers towards the end, um, mostly. But if that goes goes wrong and you know that that doesn't recover, then that's when you're probably going to experience that difficult kind of post event um, response where. You know, you still have the disrupted mood. You still have maybe some depressive symptoms and that sort of stuff, um, which will endure into the kind of post-expedition or post-return phase. Is is there a risk of uh, psychological damage from conducting uh, from exposing yourself to these scenarios? Because I I know this is going slightly off topic, but obviously research shows solitary confinement is actually quite damaging for psychological health in the long term. Um, And I wondered if there's anything that can be learned from that, from the analysis of extreme scenarios. Yes, it's it's quite complicated, I think. You know, I don't think it's easy for us to lay it out and just say this is this and this is that. Um, Some of it, I think, is to do with expectations. There was some really interesting work done quite a a long time ago now on um, like restricted environments. Um, Peter Sudfeld published some stuff on this um, in terms of how people's expectations were framed going into a a restricted environment chamber. So, you know, they're almost like they've got a hood on it. It's all blacked out and different groups were told different things. One one group was told that they were going to be confined for ages and it was going to be horrible. Um, they might get kind of abused and, and that sort of stuff. I'm not sure that's going to get through ethics nowadays, but um, yeah. that that was the kind of one side of it. And the other side was, you know, that you, you're going to be in a dark room. It's going to be all right. You're going to be let out in 30 minutes. Um, just enjoy your time on your own. And, you know, that expectation framing really impacted on the experience that people had um, and how they actually reported that experience. So I think expectation has a lot to do with what happens later. Um, which is important to get the pre part of expedition planning and going into these circumstances right. Um, clearly then as well, people can experience negative kind of responses to, to stress, particularly if they cluster. So if we get lots of stresses coming together um, and they're not managed, then then we have this kind of cluster effect which can cause kind of psychological breakdown and, and that sort of stuff, um, which may result in you know, trauma and post-traumatic stress, which can then come through kind of post-trip as well. Um, but, you know, the, the incidence rates in Antarctica, for instance, are, are no greater for um, clinical symptoms than they are in the general population. So it's, you know, there's, it does happen, but it happens everywhere. So just to clarify for people, should your expectations be that things are going to be horrendous um, and then hopefully they're not as bad as you 
would imagine, or they're in line with your expectations. Is that the right way to think about it? I, th- I don't think there's a one size fits all for expectations, but I think being realistic about what it's going to be like and maybe getting input from lots of other people about what it's going to be like, because your expectations might be wildly wrong, either positively or negatively, um, which is obviously then going to shape how you experience that next kind of step as you go into that environment. Um, and with more information, we're more aware of the things that are going on and maybe how to manage some of that stuff. But then, you know, stress is stress is good in, in certain measure. You know, it keeps us on our toes and we don't want to get rid of it altogether. Yeah, absolutely. What about boredom? Is is that something you've looked into? When, when I speak to colleagues, boredom's the thing that most of them say is the biggest danger for people in extremes. Um, partly because you know, like crevasses, we can we can do things to manage that sort of stuff and like acute moments of danger, we need to deal with it, but we can often prepare and plan for it quite well. But the boredom is the thing that kind of underlies the whole trip. You know, there'll, there'll be long durations of monotony, um, especially if you're, you know, crossing polar ice caps and walking across low stimulation deserts, even, you know, mountaineering with a big pack on and you're trudging away for seven or eight hours a day. There's going to be long periods of that monotony and boredom which causes a variety of issues. One is to do with cognitive function. You know, if we're not stimulated for a long period of time and we're boredom, how, how, how do we remain vigilant to the stress that we need to deal with immediately? So it's that kind of cognitive performance idea of if we, we're bored for long periods and it's monotonous and then something acute happens, we're a bit slow to react to it, which if you think for, I guess, long duration space missions is a popular topic, that's an issue. If you're, if you're stuck in a capsule for three years um, and you've got long durations of maybe darkness and, and low stimulation kind of activity going on, but then a fire might break out 18 months down the line and you need to deal with it. You know, it's kind of maintaining that performance. I remember t- just referring to George Bullard again. He said to me that the most difficult aspect of the expedition, where he covered around 1,400 miles, it wasn't the physical challenge of pulling 200 kilos in the sledge he said it was the boredom he said it was the monotony he said that was by far the most challenging aspect of it which i thought was fascinating because if you said to someone you're you're going to cover over a thousand miles you know on on skis or on foot they would immediately think well that's just physically horrific Mm -hmm. to deal with but he said it's nothing compared to the the mental task and the the psychological task yeah and and building up mechanisms to actually deal with that and and sometimes i think it sometimes i think it's using that opportunity you know there's probably not going to be many times in your life where you're going to be on your own and you can use that time to really do things that you want to do whether it's listen to as many books as you can and there's probably a big most people i know have got a big stack of books next to their bed that they want to read but they never get time to so sometimes i think it's making the most of an opportunity um, as opposed to seeing it maybe as a, a negative. You know, thinking ahead to what that's going to be like is is a key part, I think. And I spoke to some mountaineers recently that you know, they're quite experienced, but they've been on trips with maybe more novice mountaineers and they're, they're going out for three or four months of high altitude stuff in, in kind of the Himalayas. You know, the, the guys that have come with me that, that are kind of no, novice, they didn't bring any books with them or they didn't bring anything to do when the weather comes in and they're stuck in their tent. And because they've not thought about it. And it's like, you know, you're going to be bored if you've not thought about that stuff. So I think people get there eventually and they, they, they know what they, they can do after they've done a few of these trips, but um, it takes a bit of time to get there. So these coping mechanisms are divided into problem-focused and emotion orientated coping. What, what do those two things mean? Yeah, so the, these are kind of popular terms in the, the psychology literature. Problem-focused coping really talks about trying to change the environment to manage the stressor. So, you know, that might be if you're stuck in a tent with someone that's really doing your head in, go to another tent. So you you, you change the environment to try and manage the situation. Uh, Whereas emotion-oriented approaches tend to be more focused on the kind of the mind and the muscle side of things. So really trying to manage your internal dialogue or how you think and how you feel, um, which... In, in extreme settings tends to be the one that we see people doing more of, partly because it, it's quite hard to change the environment. You know, if you're, if you're 
isolated and confined, there's not that much you can do to change the environment. If you're you know, skiing across a, an ice cap, there's not that much you can do to change the environment. Whereas you can manage your emotional um, thought processes and how you feel. When when we look at people who take on numerous expeditions, do you think there's an element of um, a love for adventure there? And do you think there's an element of kind of seeking some form of like mastery of their particular chosen field, whatever that may be, or sorry, chosen their, their chosen path, whether that's mountaineering, whether that's, you know, I- extreme skiing, um, overwintering in Antarctica or whatever. Do you think there's a balance between those two things? And what, what does the research say about that? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going back to the kind of the age old question of why we go, you know, that's the kind of George Mallory type, why, why do we climb Everest? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure we're, never, we're ever going to get a straightforward answer to that question. I think, you know, clearly mastery is quite important for people. You know, you talk to some people that do these extreme challenges and to them it's about really pushing the limits of human endurance and that is all about challenge. You know, it's about setting a goal and going, is it is it possible? Can I do it? And I'm really pushing their limits. So, yeah, I think, you know, challenge is an important one and we know from across a range of domains that actually demonstrating our competence is a it's what we call a basic human need you know we we like to achieve um that's a f- kind of fundamental and when we talk about basic human needs we talk about they call them the essential nutrients of life and they're a bit like physical needs of water food shelter you know we need them to survive but and what are, what are they so so those they're their autonomy competence and relatedness and the idea is that we need these three things in life to really thrive. So we need to feel good at stuff, feel effective. We need to be able to feel in control of our own life and have ownership over what we're doing. And we need to be connected to other people to really thrive. And I think to some extent, those things come through in in the expedition settings. You know, if you find a really close-knit group of people that have got good camaraderie going into difficult environments where they can really demonstrate that they're good at something and take control over that situation because they're responsible then you know you're going to get all those things satisfied is there any particular piece of research out there that you've done or other people have done or any particular books that you would encourage people to take a look at and maybe this is somebody who is taking on an iron man or doing a marathon or um, doing something s- similar in their own particular uh, life is there anything you'd recommend to them yeah, there are probably a few things. So, I mean, the, the paper that there's all, there's one paper for me that kind of I read it probably once every three months. You know, and I, when I since I first discovered it, I mean, it's, I mentioned the guy earlier, this guy called Peter Sudfeld, who was a, a professor in Canada, and he wrote a paper called Homo Invictus: The Indomitable Species, and it was really talking about the resilience of human beings. You know, that we can endure a lot, we can overcome a lot. And that there's lots of different contexts where this has been shown that we we really are kind of capable of overcoming adversity. So I'd, I would encourage people to read that. It's, it's kind of enlightening. Um, can and you, can nice. you tell us his surname again? Uh, Sudfeld. So it's S U E D F E L D. So that, that that would be my kind of like favourite. I feel like, yeah. um, and he and he kind of weaves the poem Invictus throughout it as well. So it's it's kind of a nice read. From a kind of practical point of view, um, a guy, a guy, um, another sports psychologist actually down at the University of Portsmouth, a guy called Neil Weston, he he's written some good papers on kind of coping in extreme environments, um, and and there's some nice practical strategies in there for, for kind of coping with those settings. So so that could be an interesting one for people. I really enjoyed reading the book, which is just called Extreme uh, by Emma Barrett. Yeah, so Emma, Emma, actually, we've been collaborating on a few projects together. Yeah, so um, yeah, you know that that book is fantastic as well. I'll give Emma a bit of promotion there. Uh, with with everyone else, I do a podcast with. I tend to ask them a few kind of personal questions, and so um, I thought we'd fire through a few of those now. What what would you say to your eighteen year old self? Probably try and make the most of learning opportunities when they come around i try and say that to all my students now and knowing that i didn't do that necessarily when i was an undergraduate student um and it took me a few years to get to that point where i really thought okay there's lots of things i can learn that are beyond my kind of immediate priority 
And so, so probably that, you know, really take those opportunities to learn. Are there any popular beliefs that you disagree with? Or is there something that you see a lot of people doing which you fundamentally disagree with? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a sports psychologist, I guess, and I, someone that's very active, you know, and I, I really struggle. I find it hard when people are inactive. Um, and, I, and I feel like actually a lot of the time people coping strategies, and we talk about this from a kind of mental health perspective, not necessarily extreme environments, but I think a lot of people would have better psychological health if they were a little bit more physically active. So for me, that's a kind of, not a bugbear necessarily, but something that I feel like we need we need to try and make that concerted effort to be more active, just generally um, across our daily lives. There's a lot of research, isn't there, to show that running or physical exercise generally actually helps with mental health and mental well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're a colleague and I um, actually at Loughborough University and the University of Birmingham. We're involved in a big project with the mental health charity Mind at the moment, um, and we're actually evaluating one of their health promotion programs um, to see how physical activity promotes mental health so yeah I'm, I'm definitely an advocate of that and i you know i think it's a it's a good way of improving mood and um, just general well-being there's a great book called spark s-p-a-r-k which touches on that i don't know if you've read it it's focused in particular on running okay. and the the positive impacts of that on on um, mental health um i know we t- we touched on reading a little bit just now but are, th- are there any particular books that you have read over and over again you know are, are you interested in kind of books on scott uh similar Randolph fines or anyone like that 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 you would encourage people to take a look at yeah so i mean obviously you know scott and shackleton you know big big players and inspirations um the books, I, I, you know, I always enjoy reading books by Wilfred Thesiger about his, his kind of travels in the Middle East. That's an area that fascinates me. Um, Jim Whittaker, I think, writes really eloquently, the first American to climb Everest. You know, his his outlook on risk and taking risks to build kind of personal strength, they really, they resonate with me, I guess, from the research I've been doing. Kind of, I guess, Asprey Cherry Garrard's kind of account, Worst Journey in the World, you know, that's my kind of favourite polar book, if you like, and something that I go back to now and then. Um, and then, if you know, for the psychology and extremes, Emma's book Extreme is is really good, to, a good account, and covers the topic at a really nice level. A big, broad account of lots of different psychology and extreme settings. And it's it is really accessible. I thought, you know, I think yeah, you don't have to be a you know psychology aficionado to read it and enjoy it. Absolutely. And, and if you if you do want to find out more, it's got all the references mm. in, so you can yeah, go and yeah. dig a little bit if you need to. It's a very rich and, you know, well-researched book, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Emma and Paul, um, who wrote it, did, I think did a really good job, yeah. Um, so the last question I tend to ask people is, uh, who or what inspires you? Yeah, yeah another good question. Um, I could probably sit back and go back through, like, the years and look at loads of different people. But I'll probably keep it a bit more modern and I'd say the person who I owe quite a lot of gratitude to is Ben Saunders. Um, he's the probably the one that really got me interested in extreme environments, kind of watching some of his TED Talks and kind of him encouraging people to get out of the house to figure out who you are and that sort of stuff and has been really kind of accommodating with some projects we've been doing. So, you know, he, he's a big inspiration for me. Um, and then from, from I'm a scientist, so from an academic point of view, I'd say... The conversations I have with people like Emma Emma Barrett and um, Professor Grossandal in Norway, where we can sit down and really kind of thrash out ideas of what's happening from a psychological perspective, and you know, I, I buzz off that kind of stuff. So um, those sort of conversations are inspiring to me, kind of on a day to day level, keep me motivated and keep me going. Um, but you know, the, you know, there's people like Leveson Wood, you know, who's doing interesting journeys, expeditions, which aren't just about you know, pushing the boundaries necessarily physically, but they're about really engaging with people, which I find really interesting as well. Um, and, you know, it's not all just about bravado and kind of really pushing yourself to the limits. It, it can be uh, a slightly different type of adventure. I've, I've recorded a podcast with Lev, actually. I'll go back and, and listen to that. And, <laughs> and he's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I think that's a great place to end it. Thanks very much. Nathan. My pleasure, Toby. Thank you very much.